I want to mention at the outset of this that um, uh, while the panel is going to focus on the discussion about affordability, um, I think the bigger picture is um, that uh, more resources have to be brought to bear. And the Conference of Mayors um, has been a, uh, engaged, as I know a number of other stakeholders, in the discussion with our federal government about the need for the federal government to step up in a much more significant way than they have. And the um, Conference of Mayors adopted a, uh, uh, first of all, they, we did a, um, a poll around the country. And for the first time this past year, um, water issues topped the list of uh, infrastructure concerns. Roads and bridges used to always be at the top. But now, water and wastewater is at the top. And so in line with that, uh, the, the Conference of Mayors um, adopted a set of priority uh, positions that called for $50 billion, uh, not $1 billion, not $5 billion, not $10 billion, but $50 billion to be invested uh, with us at the local level on uh, water and wastewater. Um, obviously, there's been no movement on that, but that doesn't mean it's not a need. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be paying attention and that when we leave here, not only should we be doing all that we're now doing, we should also be engaging with our legislators at the federal level to make certain that they understand that we have real needs that they're ignoring. Right? They're ignoring them. And we can't ignore them. So we all need to obviously be uh, engaged in solving all the issues we're engaged in. But if we're not vocal in talking about our needs, they're not going to pay attention to us. If we're silent, they will not know. So no excuses, folks. It's up to us to tell our state reps, our congressional reps, our senators, they need to do their jobs. They need to get us resources at the local level so that, in fact, we can perform what have been adopted as our national interests around clean water, around drinking water, around the public health issues that, in fact, exist. Having said that, we ought to talk now about the issues that we have to deal with every day around affordability. And we have to acknowledge that this issue wasn't solved with the white papers that have been adopted thus far and the discussions. Uh, this is still a very mushy area. And while 2% um, is acknowledged as just one element, uh, the fact is, is it was adopted in most of the negotiations that most of us were subjected to as not the ceiling, but the floor of what was expected from us. And now we're all confronting a variety of uh, consent decree costs that, as Mike Summers talked about, could impose on our most vulnerable populations costs that are in a 10% range of their household income. And that just is oppressive. That just has to be seen for the injustice that it is. So we all need to face that, and we need to have a discussion about that. And in some of our communities, upwards of 40% of our populations, in fact, are being stressed by what we're charging them. That isn't sustainable. Federal, state, and local officials all need to consider the actual cost of living in our communities when they, in fact, force local governments uh, to impose rate increases that just are not affordable. And there are models out there. And so this next section of today's uh, program is to talk about what the alternatives are. How, how can we expand our thinking? How do we truly come to understand what a, a family is experiencing uh, in our neighborhoods. And that involves really becoming aware of what the total costs are and what the limitations are on household income. So with that, we're going to 
uh, now hear from a series of, of experts who have insights into that uh, uh, discussion. And uh, I think hopefully uh, we'll have some time for conversation and questions before the Lieutenant Governor addresses it, us at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Berger, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Chris Hornback. I'm the Deputy CEO for the National Association of, of Clean Water Agencies, or NACWA. Many of you are, are members of our association. Uh, for those of you that don't uh, know who we are, we're a trade association that represents public wastewater treatment and stormwater agencies across the country. Uh, we work in Washington, D.C. on regulatory, legislative, and uh, legal advocacy. So. Since two, the 2003-2004 time frame, when our members, many of, of you are in, in the room now, uh, started to come uh, to Washington, D.C. and raise concerns about consent decrees that you all were negotiating, um, talking about affordability, and realizing as you were having those conversations that you were, you were agreeing to spending that was going to put your communities into um, a situation where you would be charging unaffordable rates and, and low-income citizens would be uh, overburdened with water and wastewater costs. Uh, one of the problems that you identified for us was EPA's approach to evaluating afford affordability, this 2% of median household income that you've been hearing about. Now, let, let me stress something that, that Andrew Sawyers mentioned earlier today. I'm going to state it in a slightly different way. There is no scenario, at this point in 2019, there is no scenario in which any community should, should be solely relying on, or really relying on at all, uh, the 2% of median household income number when you're talking with the government. Uh, the EPA has created enough opening and enough flexibility to put that aside. Now, um, why are we up here talking about it then? Well, because there's still a lot of guidance documents out there and there's still a lot of parts of EPA that begin those conversations with I want you to do the workbook calculation and tell me where you fall out on our matrix in terms of 2% of median household income. That's the reality that we're dealing with, that it's still very much, despite the, the mythology that Lauren talked about, uh, it, it, it is in the past, but it's still very much in the future, or still very much in the present in terms of its use. So we've been working for the last, I have personally been working on this issue since 2003, 2004, so 15 plus years trying to get EPA to move away from median household income. Uh, we have been uh, following the mayor's leadership on this issue, and we've been working hand in hand with the, the conference. Some of our advocacy is focused on, on Capitol Hill. And um, earlier, uh, Mr. Voinovich was, was mentioned uh, when he was a senator uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., this was one of his top issues. The Ohio delegation has been a leader on uh, the issue of affordability, introducing numerous uh, pieces of legislation to change uh, the approach that EPA uses. But we're still talking about it. Uh, and you've heard from uh, all of the speakers here this morning, integrated planning is uh, inextricably linked to affordability. The two go hand in hand. If you look at the framework, uh, affordability is a key aspect of integrated planning. So for integrated planning to succeed, we have to be talking about affordability in the right way. And so um, that advocacy on Capitol Hill was so important, it led to uh, Senate appropriators in 2016 directing the National Academy of Public Administration, who you'll hear from later this afternoon, to develop a report on the issue of affordability and uh, develop recommendations for EPA. Uh, that report, and, and Brenna will talk a little bit more about it in a minute, that came out in 2017, affirmed that EPA, uh, so affirmed that EPA should in fact update its methods and outlined a number of recommendations that EPA should follow as it updated its uh, approach to determining affordability. Now, the water sector groups that you see here on the slide, NACWA, AWWA, and the Water Environment Federation, realized that as EPA started to look at the NAPA report, we were going to be asked, what does the water sector want? If not MHI, then what do you want us to, to look at in terms of an agency approach to affordability ac across all water programs? So the three associations with your money, uh, the money that you all pay us in dues, we funded a project of experts uh, with Raf Tellus being the lead consultant, Corona environmental consultants, and the Gallardi Rothstein group to 
evaluate what are the methodologies that are out there and give us a recommendation. So in uh, the, well, I'll just say earlier this year, we've, we've delivered our report to EPA. We, we did it in draft form and we did it in a final form uh, at the end of April of this year. And since that time, we've been meeting with EPA uh, extensively to um, communicate with them where, where we think they should be going um, and uh, provide them with some background on the methodology that we came up with. So let me just give you a quick overview of, of what we did. The, the details of this slide are important, but what, what you see here is on, across the top are a, a range of affordability um, methodologies, a, a range of ways to calculate household affordability. Um, on the left-hand side is a list of criteria. That, cri that list of criteria was developed in part from the report that Brenna is going to talk about in a few minutes from Napa, but it was refined by a number of interviews and conversations that we had with stakeholders, stakeholders like utilities, stakeholders like the mayors, environmental groups, social justice groups. What were, in terms of if you had your way and you were developing a new affordability methodology, what, what are the criteria that are the most important to you? So we, we developed that list of criteria. We crosswalked the available methodologies that were out there. Now, a key question for us and a key audience for us across all of this was, what is EPA going to uh, embrace? Uh, whatever we developed, uh, we knew needed to be implementable by EPA. It had to be something that was um, maybe not as simple as their 2% of median household income, their current residential indicator, but something pretty darn close to that simple, uh, but um, more refined and addressing some of those really important criteria. All right, so here's the, here's the money slide. So the, um, the metric that we came up with, and I'm gonna say it right off, off the bat, it's not perfect. Uh, it is the best balance of the most critical criteria that uh, we identified. Uh, and we, f we feel that maybe with some refinements, and that's some of the conversation that we're having with EPA, that is, it is uh, the best fit for the purpose. So as I said, there are other methods out there, and we are going to hear from experts uh, later in the session who um, are doing much more granular level, local level uh, looks at affordability. This approach is not intended for those granular looks. This is intended to replace that screening level uh, evaluation, that 2% of median household income that EPA has been using sort of as the gateway for all negotiations. There, there's a lot to unpack here, and I don't have the time to unpack it with you today. Uh, I, can, I can send you the link to the report if you're interested, just leave me your card. Um, what, what we're proposing is a little bit more complex. So the, the current residential indicator is a single component. It's percent of median household income. Uh, we have two metrics that, that are being combined. The first is a, a household burden indicator. Um, a couple of very important things to note. One, we're looking at the 20th percentile income. We're not looking at median. So we're looking at that lowest quintile. That was one of the important factors that, that uh, uh, Napa identified. Look at the lowest income population. Um, the numerator of that household burden indicator is not total water costs divided by households as is currently with EPA's approach. It is uh, what is the actual low income house paying? What is their bill? That's what we're trying to project there. I'm getting the two minute signal, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just wrap up real quick. The, the second half of our uh, metric is the poverty prevalence indicator. So one of the things that was important to our stakeholders and to Napa was how prevalent across, uh, what percent of your population, of your ratepayers, is at a certain threshold in terms of poverty. We picked 200% uh, of the federal poverty level because that is a, uh, a pretty standard uh, measure that a lot of communities should be able to, to evaluate for their community. So like EPA's um, approach currently, our approach breaks down to a very simple matrix where you're looking at um, household burden indicators, costs, the actual bill costs for a, a low income homeowner um, as a percent of LQI uh, crosswalked with poverty prevalence indicator. It breaks down to a very similar um, uh, matrix of burden um, and we think that it's, it's very implementable by EPA. So that's, that's the first half of affordability. The second half of affordability as it's currently envisioned by EPA is financial capability. 
for the financial capability recommendations that we put together, basically we said utilities should do what they're doing already when they go to the bond market or they go to borrow money from anyone. You have to do a cash flow forecast, you have to look at your revenues, your needs, and your expenses, and you gotta project those out. So do that, and if you, and if you do it the way that we're, we're proposing, you have a, a nice look at the next 19, 20 years, and you can look back and see how that impacts that lowest quintile of income across the entire program. So you're projecting out what the bill impacts are gonna look like for the rest of the, the rest of the program. All right, so to, to conclude, we are encouraging EPA to adopt uh, a new methodology. We, we feel like this is the approach that I just quickly went through is a, a, a pretty good um, approach. Um, I, I do wanna note on, on this slide here, these um, thresholds greater than 10% of LQI, we believe is roughly equivalent to greater than 2% of median household income. So this is, this is, we're not proposing that these are the thresholds that should be used. These are essentially equivalent to where EPA is now, um, we believe, as it translates into our methodology. And there's the zero minutes. So we're encouraging EPA to adopt the new methodology. We are very encouraged by the conversations that we're having with EPA. Uh, as Andrew alluded to earlier, they are starting to think about that lowest quintile. They're starting to think um, about the issue differently, and we're very encouraged by that. Um, we do have more work to do on completing the validation of those thresholds um, that I mentioned. And um, we've got some more work in terms of enhancing the methodology, but we think it's a good start. So with that, uh, feel free to shoot me an email if, if you want to uh, ask any questions or uh, drop me a card and I'll follow up with the report. And now I think I'm going to turn it over to Rich Anderson with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Thank you guys so much. So there is a solution. There's three solutions to pick from. They all start with S. Anybody in Washington, from Washington, you know what a slug line is? Yeah, right? So you're trying to go home, you get in line, wait for... Okay, so... That's right. Uh, the first is you can give a subsidy. Feds. You can have schedule expansion, which is a basic backbone of integrated planning. <clears throat> or you could do a slug line on new mandates. Okay? So, uh, uh, Rich Anderson, Conference of Mayors. I have three new Avenger Marvel heroes, uh, Director Stevenson, Tiffany, and Jerry Rouch. The man who put his head in a sewer instead of the sand. Thank you. Okay, so we have the Clean Water Act is, is the root of both our problem and our benefits. And the mayors of the United States fully support the Clean Water Act. They don't necessarily like the way it's implemented all the time. But you have sort of a layer cake foundation here, and it establishes the federal authority. One of the issues with both the Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act, they have triggered action forcing mechanisms, same as the Clean Air Act. And EPA has to continually go through a process and look at what's the next thing that we have to regulate. There's nothing wrong with that, but a slug line might help us be able to meet what the agency is requiring. So one of the problems with this, uh, if you will, is you've got here Section 281 uniform rates, you have uniform rates in bond covenants, and you have state laws specifying uniform rates when you have state revolving fund loans. So the uniform rates you need in the financial community in order to guarantee repayment of the bond or the loan. Uh, but it also puts us in America, in our political economy of user pay, it puts us into a bind. And I think we see this with these consent decrees. We're literally in a box painting ourselves in a corner on affordability and there doesn't appear to be a way out. Well, you got subsidy, slug, right, and scheduling to choose from. So there are options. But the problem is that this entire thing here, you know, it's a layer cake and it has, uh, it's workable for 
compliance and debt financing, but then it crushes the people who have to pay the rates in certain income categories, not all categories. So the, so the distinction between affordability and repayment is very important. Even in Flint, some people continue to pay the water and sewer bills. Not everybody dropped out. So that's de evidence, demonstration there, that some are willing to pay the rate whether they can afford it or not, and that's a good thing. So 40 years of the Clean Water Act regulation, very favorable to outstanding outcomes, and most of that has to do with the operators in this room. Uh, not with necessarily the mayor, uh, not with the state regulator or the federal regulator, but the operators. The reason why this system works is because of you, and my hat is off to you. Some of the benefits I've shown here, we don't need to go into these because you already know them. But then look at what happened here. Uh, local government spending just on sewer. Now when I say sewer, I mean wastewater and sewer, okay? If you're a mayor, you always say sewer. We don't have time to say wastewater, okay? So in 93, the nation, and when I say nation, local government, which accounts for 98% of all the spending on water and sewer in America. 21.7 billion, 150% increase by 2016. That's not 40 years, that's much less than 40 years. Up to 54 billion. Okay, Ohio, 93, 1 billion. 2016, 2 billion. This is according to census data. Thank God uh, Mr. Rauch's SRF is here or those figures for Ohio would be very much lower. What's a substantial financial burden, though, is the problem on affordability. And so the question is, how do you really measure what's a substantial burden? Because it's a relative term. Uh, what we found in a 35-city study was we could calculate how many people were paying more than 2% MHI more than 4.5% of MHI, including water, sewer, and stormwater. And we had a range of communities that went up to 40%. So I pick Escondido just as one. 148,000 people, poverty rate 18%, median household income about 50,000. 2% uh, of MHI would be about 1,000, 4.5% of MHI, which would be water, sewer, and storm water, would be 2,200. Current, cu current average cost per household uh, comes out to $1,730,000. So with that kind of information, you can say how much are people spending in what income categories, and I gave the, uh, to Dave uh, the California cost per household study for the website, which gives you the tables for the 30-some communities and tells you exactly how much the cost will be across the income spectrums. So 34% of the households were ex spending over 4.5% of actual income. Annually, this is 12.1 million in excess of the 4.5 combined over a 10 year period from these three lowest income deciles, 122 million in extra burden, which is really expropriated from those households in the lowest income groups and they will never be able to use that money for healthcare, education, transportation, housing, or anything else, because it's already gone. Now, 11 of the study area communities have 10-year period financial burdens over 10 million. One particular community was 230 million from their poorest income strata. So here's a list of some of the widespread impacts. So the way you look at this is you look at is it a significant burden, a substantial burden, and is it widespread in the community? And we found these excesses range from 21 to about 40 for these communities. Uh, that is the signal of problem. 
So how do you really define affordability? And, uh, you know, when the 2% MHI came across, you, you have to give EPA uh, some slack here. They use the central limit theorem, which we know and we, we love. We bless God for that because we can now have matrix algebra to do testable hypotheses, right? And that keeps us making decisions. But if the decision point is arbitrary, 2% MHI, that's an abstraction. That really doesn't tell you what a household can afford. So the lack of accuracy in measuring affordability uh, then leads to an insensitivity in the enforcement of the regulation and thus the investment that's required to comply. Two minutes, okay. So widespread economic burdens we've seen and we see substantial impact. Let me show you this, this table here. So if you look in the, the right uh, tables on the right from uniform rate over to 1.5 percent. Okay, so what do I do here? So on the uniform rates in this particular mystery town in Ohio, all right, we have the income breakdowns and we have what the just the sewer cost would be and what percent of their household income it would be. And then I did an exercise to say, what, in, what if we had, instead of uniform rates, we had uniform percentage rates? And so I did a sensitivity analysis and said, okay, for the residential part of this system, they needed to raise eight and a half million uh, every year. Right, not a big community. So on the eight and a half million, if I could look at 5% of income, 4%, 3%, et cetera. So I did a sensitivity analysis down. When you got down to 1.5%, then if you look at the lower income groups, they're at 1.5%. Every income group is at 1.5%. And so then how much money do you, revenues do you generate depends on the number of households in that category. So here's what it looks like if you graph this. Right, so the blue line is a uniform rate, and you could see over on the left margin with poor people are paying high rates. If you said I had a uniform percentage rate, look at the red line and how it shifts the cost to those more able to afford it. Now, can this happen in America? Right, we have a political economy of user pay. You're all welcome on the bus, but if you don't got a dime, get off, okay? That's not the America we want to be in. So we have to think about different ways of looking at this. Is this legally allowable? Not with uniform rates imposed, unless uniform rates were redefined. Okay, so my last slide. We need to move away from MHI altogether. It makes no sense, it's an abstraction. Federal poverty level is an abstraction. It's an abstraction of the deserving poor. But when we looked at California, we saw the deserving poor, the 20%, but as you saw here, there's another 20%, the working poor. And we need to look at different measures to understand the threshold of what it costs to live in a city before we impose multiple costs. And I think that the next couple of speakers are going to give you some alternatives, and I thank you for your time. So my background is I'm a professor, uh, so a little bit different than most of you here, uh, but I've studied a lot of your work. And um, about 10 years ago, we started the ALICE Project and Alice is someone that I would like to bring to this conversation because I think it adds an important perspective on what you're talking about in terms of affordability. But to give it some uh, uh, detail and a face um, that may be missing. So Alice is an acronym for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. And so we're talking about households that are working mostly low wage jobs with little or no savings and just getting by. Sometimes they're getting 
by not quite as well as other people. They're having to make some really hard choices. Um, so I will show you some details about that, but just a little bit so you know where we're coming from. This is a project that's been going for about um, 10 years. We have developed a, a whole series of measures that help us understand what's going on in our economy, where our current government statistics are um, uh, not as detailed or as accurate as they should be. Uh, we have data for all 3,000 plus counties in the country, um, and we work with partners across the state. So uh, we, we love working in a big group like this uh, with, with partners who, who, who care about what's going on in their communities. Uh, we did a, a report for Ohio a couple years ago, and that is going to be updated next year, so the timing's really good, too. Um, but in all of our work, uh, we reach out and have a local research advisory committee of experts. Uh, so we had a stellar group uh, from Ohio, and you all may know some of these folks. All right, so let's get into the data, and what, what are we talking about here? So in most places, our understanding of financial hardship is the federal poverty level. That was a measure developed about 50 years ago when Lyndon Johnson needed a, a measure for his war on poverty. So it was basically food should be a third of your budget. What does it cost for a family of four? Multiply that by three. That number has been ticked up ever since. So it doesn't account for all the changes in uh, budgets that have happened over time. And it doesn't allow for variation between communities, let alone between states. So the federal poverty level is the exact same number in Columbus as New York as Mississippi. So it, it doesn't get into some of the challenges that you all are facing on, on the ground. So what we've done is measure what it actually costs to live and work in every county in the country, and then measure how many people earn below that. So for Ohio, about 14% of households are at that official federal poverty level, but another 28% are below the Alice threshold. So earning above the federal poverty level, but below what it actually costs to, to, to live in that community. Um, we found similar statistics across the country. Ohio is pretty much right in the middle. So um, this, this is a, a consistent finding. So here's the budget that we base it on, because I think it's really important that there is this transparency. We don't know what goes into the federal poverty number anymore, because it's just been t this odd calculation ticked up over time. But for the survival budget, we have a, a consistent set of criteria, housing, childcare, food, transportation, health care, and most recently, um, we added the cost of a basic smartphone plan. So for, in 2016 in Ohio, that had added up to almost $20,000 for a single adult and over $60,000 for a family of four with two children in childcare. So it's also important to notice what's not in this budget. There's no savings, there's no travel, there's no birthday presents. Um, it is a bare bones, minimal budget. So the criteria, the bare minimum to live and work in the modern economy. So in most places in Ohio, you have to have a car to get to work. So you need to have transportation. If parents can work, they need to be in childcare. So that's the strict criteria. And I really want to emphasize this is not an aspirational budget. It's really hard to feed your family um, on this budget. It's hard to find housing. Um, and I think when you look at that housing line, to think that that includes utilities is shocking. So bare bones. Um, the data comes from a set of officially available sources. Um, you, I'm sure you're all familiar, HUD, USDA, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, so there's two parts to this. There's what does it actually cost to live? Um, and then on the other side, what do, wage, what, what do jobs pay? What are, what are wages? And so it's the gap that's the challenge. So this next slide looks at um, the budget compared to some of the most common occupations. And so the dark yellow is the cost for the single survival budget, and the lighter yellow is for the family survival budget. And you can see many of the, the, the top jobs in Ohio and, and the country 
food prep, cashiers, retail sales, office workers, they don't pay enough to support a family. Um, only one job in the, in the top seven, a registered nurse, could provide um, a survival budget for, for their family. So it's this mismatch between what jobs are paying and what it actually costs on the ground is, is why we have so many Alice households. So I'm going to take a minute and, and walk through where Alice lives and, and some of the demographics and then talk about some of the other consequences. Um, so first of all, Alice lives across the state of Ohio. Um, ranging from 25% of a county's population in Delaware County to 61% in Athens and Adams County. So it's a significant portion of every community. And uh, I, I want to call out a couple of the cities of uh, people that were represented here today that uh, one of the lowest percents is uh, in Avon Lake, where 5% of the population is in poverty, but another 18% is Alice. So 23% of households in a fairly wealthy community are below the Alice threshold. That goes up to 66% in Lima. And just for comparison, 47% of households in Columbus are below the Alice threshold. Uh, in Lakewood, 49%. In Elrira, 53%, and in Akron, 59%. So all of you have a lot of Alice households uh, in, in your communities. So Alice households come in all ages, all race and ethnicities, all household types, and all geographies. Um, so we um, have a lot of the breakdowns, and I'll just go through those quickly because I think you're getting the point. Um, but uh, Alice households are much more likely to be in uh, younger households, those headed by someone under the age of 25, but also um, senior households. And here's a really great example of, of where our current government statistics aren't doing their job, is the Social Security gets most seniors out of poverty, but it doesn't bring all seniors up to financial stability. So there are a large number of senior households that are Alice. Um, Alice households are in all race and ethnicities. Sometimes we have stereotypes of who we think of, of being in poverty, but Alice uh, doesn't fit those stereotypes. Um, and we think it's actually helpful to, to move away from talking about poverty to, to talking about Alice and, and people that can help change the conversation. Um, Alice uh, is, is in all uh, family types, so married families, single parent uh, headed households. And another interesting thing I think that uh, with the end of the Great Recession in 2010, we're expecting to see economic recovery and certainly recently we've had a lot of good economic news come out. But this Alice indicator really helps us identify that that prosperity has not reached all households. So over time that we've seen in Ohio that the number of households in poverty has actually remained fairly stable around 14, 15%. But we're seeing the percent of Alice households increasing from 2010 where it was 25% to 28% in 2016. So while the when you look at the poverty rate, you think, okay, things are stable. Well, actually, we're seeing things get worse during a time of economic recovery. Um, I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about wages and the job side of this, because I think it helps uh, flesh out the, the, the whole picture. So looking at the number of jobs by hourly wage in Ohio, we find that more than 60% pay less than $20 an hour, and most of those are paying less than $15 an hour. So that's where the real challenge comes. We have a lot of jobs with low wages, and we have a certain cost of living. Let's look at who, where those jobs are, um, because I think to get a face on Alice is really important. Alice works in jobs that we need to make our economy run smoothly. So retail sales, food prep, uh, child care, bank tellers, mechanics, laborers. Um, you know, by the time you got to the conference today, you probably interacted with several Alice uh, workers. 
picking up your coffee, dropping off your child at childcare, parking in the garage. Um, so all jobs that we know, that we interact with, and yet if those people can't afford to live in the communities where we need those jobs, there's a problem. And then a key part of, of Alice is the lack of savings. So when you have an emergency that we all have, but you don't have any reserves, you don't have any cushion, then your ability to uh, continue is very difficult. So this is an example of if you have uh, your you know, paycheck to paycheck, your car breaks down, you need $700 for a new car transmission. You don't have it. You can't get to work. If Alice works in hourly paid jobs, so if you don't go to work, you don't get paid. So if Alice doesn't get paid for a couple of days, Alice not only doesn't have money for the car repair, Alice doesn't have money to pay the rent or the other bills that continue throughout the month. And this is, um, this can be uh, a, a, you know, a breakdown of a car or a tree falling on your house. Um, it can be a snowstorm. It can be a health incident. Um, and these are things that all families face um, on a regular basis. You can't always predict them. But Alice also has fewer resources to um, prevent them. So Alice is much less likely to have insurance, for example. So the, the burden of this uh, falls harder on those households. Um, and to that, I wanted to emphasize that Alice really relies on the infrastructure where they live. Um, without those resources, Alice really needs uh, uh, the, the, the resources that are provided in the community, good roads, uh, broadband, electricity is huge, and of course, water. Um, and then Alice is, is more prone, or is more vulnerable to when those systems break down. So a lot of housing that's cheaper, where Alice can afford to live, is more likely to be fl flood prone. Alice is more likely to live in substandard housing, again, because it's cheaper. So much more likely to, to have the fallout for when infrastructure doesn't work. Um, so I wanted to wrap up with a little discussion on how the ALICE measures are being used, um, and they're being used by a wide range of community stakeholders across the country. Um, but they have not been used for, for water assessment, so you all, I'm hoping, will be path breakers. Um, but a, a lot of government uh, departments and agencies at the state and local level are using ALICE, uh, things for eligibility for programs, um, a lot of strategic planning. Uh, Alice is very helpful in identifying uh, long-term needs and uh, population trends. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in, in, in work uh, planning as well, so workforce development. And um, in addition, FEMA is using the Alice data to help map uh, disaster recovery. And a lot of communities are using the Alice data to help uh, get out the census 2020 count. Um, Alice is one of those hard to count uh, groups, and so we're helping to map that and target it so that um, those groups can be better counted next time. So we have a lot of data on our website, uh, unitedforalice.org. You can click on uh, Ohio and call up, uh, we have a map of the state, click on your county, uh, click on your city, and you can get budgets, graphs, um, there's also uh, data spreadsheets you can download, county pages. Um, so I think a lot of resources that can be helpful to your work. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Scott Bernstein, founder of the Center for Neighborhood Technology, which uh, helps communities in the Midwest and across the United States figure out how to set goals for uh, affordability and sustainability and how to devise strategies for capturing the value of that um, achievement. I've been doing it for 42 years and uh, one disclosure, I officially retired on Monday, but I can't afford it. And <laughs> I can afford it even less after I saw Stephanie's uh, shocking disclosures on the cost of living. Um, so uh, what I wanna do here is to um, 
really share some experiences we've had thinking about the tensions between uh, investing to make a system work better versus uh, investing to make a community or a place work better. Number two, I uh, give you a detailed case study of what it was like to work over the last two years with the mayor and her team in the city of Flint trying to address these issues while they were simultaneously dealing with the lead water uh, crisis there. And number three, uh, do a version not quite as deep as Stephanie's of what an existing set of tools could uh, provide uh, to help uh, improve the way that affordability scores uh, are used with the hope of a synthesis coming out of um, this discussion. Um, so let's start with a, a short review of the difference between investing for what I call system benefits um, versus, um, versus community benefits. And of course, this came across smaller than I planned. They say power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely, and this just <laughs> does it. So if you're bionic, you can read it. We, um, we surveyed states across the United States, uh, their departments of transportation, because the people and the data were available. And I think the principle that came out of this will be obvious. Here, and we asked their um, secretaries or equivalent and, and research directors or equivalent, how do you measure the economic impact of the billions of dollars that you invest over time? Most of the answers from the states, that's the triangle on the left, the big clump at the bottom says systems benefits, and the top clump at the top says community benefits. They said that we make our systems operate in a state of good repair, and that produces long-term benefits to everybody, and we get short-term benefits off of, um, off of building the things in the way of job creation. When we ask the same question of mayors and heads of metropolitan planning organizations, it was the other way around. They say, we make our community work better and affordable for, and livable for everybody, and they had a little bit to say about condition and performance and congestion mitigation and, uh, and short-term job creation. They say we create long-term jobs. We want a sustainable economy, not a, not a quick fix. And then we went into some detail on what these things are. And it's sort of the bottom two rungs of this are labeled cost effectiveness and benefit cost ratio data. And then system condition and performance, that was the um, the, the answers from the states, and then the answers from local and regional government were quite different. Affordability, cost of living, equity, value creation, and value uh, capture, long-term job creation, uh, economic development, the fiscal benefits of infill and, and economic development, and then a, a variety of answers on uh, health, uh, uh, livability, security, safety, um, you would think these two sets of people were living in different planets, frankly, when you, when you read the answers and listened to them. And I hope to be able to put some resources together to do this survey with respect to how states and the federal government and local governments would answer these same questions about water infrastructure. I think it's important to document it and it would back up what Mayor Dave Berger had to say about the cultural differences that need to be bridged here if we're really gonna co-manage uh, the problem at hand. Now, um, uh, the guy on the left, former Oregon Governor Kitzhaber, uh, was in, uh, I was in the room with him when he said this, that as governments were on the hook uh, to uh, come up with and maintain the money for core legacy uh, investments, uh, infrastructure, translation, water, sewer, sidewalks, roads, and so forth. And he said, but then there's the stuff we're really interested in, the clean energy economy, green infrastructure, universal broadband. You know, how do we get these sorts of things um, done? In the right, uh, sitting next to President Obama, who I'll brag, spent two years on my board of directors before he was demoted to President of the United States. Um, uh, the guy sitting next to him was Memphis Mayor A.C. Wharton, and he had a perspective on today's topic which uh, was fundamental. He said, I won't live long enough to see the poverty rate we have today, 27, 28% in Memphis, lowered to even the average in the South of 17%. And he asked us, what could we possibly do 
to at least set a goal in the next 10 years for getting down to a 10% reduction in the poverty rate by that. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. So I want you to keep those images in mind. And then let's travel across the Midwest now to um, Flint, Michigan. Uh, we did something called the Great Lakes Water Project. We're using foundation money. We, uh, we, we put out an RFP and we gave communities that responded a voucher for technical assistance to do an in-depth review on how they were responding to the pressures they were under to replace or upgrade uh, their infrastructure and hopefully to make better decisions based on something more like the right-hand triangle's worth of uh, performance measures. Uh, while not ignoring the need to actually be made whole on the cost of actually renewing their systems and making them uh, work right. And we did that in Flint, Michigan, Gary, Indiana, Buffalo, New York, Dearborn, Michigan, and a little bit in Chicago uh, over the last um, two years. So the problem in all of these was that the increasing cost of maintaining infrastructure was driven by higher regulatory standards and performance standards, climate change, and low investment, historically, that was um, catching up. Uh, decreasing agency budgets were happening in the context of weak markets, uh, fewer uh, ratepayers, particularly in cities with shrinking populations, and lower um, incomes. So if the cost for water and sewer services had to go up to finance the billions of dollars in infrastructure investment needed, how could the utilities ensure affordability throughout their um, service territory? So we formed a partnership in Flint, now to the case study, with the key stakeholders there, which were the city and the county and the state of Michigan and um, uh, a really long list of community uh, stakeholders, um, elected officials, appointed officials, environmental justice advocates and groups. Um, and we met. Our meetings were all held in the major um, free water distribution center because in large parts of Flint you couldn't drink the water. We kept reminding everybody that there was an actual um, crisis going on. And what happened in Flint, just to remind you, and then I'll move off of the emergency, was the city filed for bankruptcy, the state assigned an emergency manager to save costs who ordered the city to switch the water source from uh, the Detroit uh, Water Department source to the Flint River more corrosive, unconditioned water, it turned the whole system into a lead poisoning machine. This triggered a variety of citizen science, technical assistance, organizing, leadership actions, and it led eventually to commitments to lead service line replacement, health actions supported by massive funder action. Um, I, I, I'm not supposed to tell you how much money the foundations in the Midwest came up with. It's bigger than the, um, than the costs of some water departments in the cities that you're in right now. It's very expensive to let something like this go wrong. Um, coming clean on the real cost of infrastructure was part of this. There was no way to raise uh, taxes in a poor community unless you said what it was going to actually um, take, and a willingness to rethink public investment in a disinvested community creatively. Flint was designed in the very first part of the last century to hit a population of 250,000. It was designed by a contractor to General Motors. This was the founding city of what became uh, General Motors. Uh, it's still the major employer there. It almost hit 200,000 in, in 1960 and started dropping. The uh, population in 2016 was just under 100,000. Uh, median income, $25,650, a 42% uh, poverty rate. Um, that red line is the future expected capital obligations, and the blue line is what they can actually raise locally off of the water bills. So there's the gap that needs to be met. How many cities have actually published in their audit this kind of disclosure? Anybody here? I mean, this was a brave move on their part to not only contract and get beyond denial, but to share it publicly. Uh, it caused all sorts of problems. Now, what the water bill today does is, by labeling it the water bill, uh, it tells a half truth. Uh, less than half the cost in Flint actually goes to pay for water service, and uh, the rest goes for 
uh, infrastructure. It goes to pay for the cost of the treatment plants for both water and sewer. It goes to pay for the distribution lines for water and sewer. It goes to pay for the energy and the chemical costs and so forth. And um, in fact, in 21 cities we surveyed in the, um, in the Great Lakes, the range was from 60 to 80 percent of what was called the water bills. We're paying for things other than water and the pressure is on all those other things to keep increasing. So, um, so this is a problem. Okay, now speaking of affordability, um, the key to a measure is understanding, and I think Stephanie did an excellent job of understanding the difference between arbitrarily saying we need more money, we need higher wages, we need higher aggregate income versus that plus doing something to actually reduce the cost of living. If I gave everybody in this room a dollar an hour raise, you would get that dollar less what you pay according to your marginal tax rate. So you wouldn't get a dollar an hour. But if I could invest in each of your communities in a way to reduce your cost of living by a dollar an hour net, you get to keep the whole dollar. We don't tax you on productivity or efficiency in the United States. And so that's actually a built-in incentive to marry what we're talking about with the uh, water infrastructure improvements here with strategies for efficient use of the, of the resource. And I'll conclude with an example of how to do that. Using the 4.5% uh, guideline, since, as I said, the bill is both water and sewer and everything that goes with it, uh, and looking at a three-month representative sample of actual water bills, not the past due bills and the cumulative past due bills, which are in the, the stratosphere. The average Flint monthly water and sewer bill is $110 a month. And that's close to the average uh, bill right next door here in Columbus. The difference is there's twice as much income per household on average in Columbus than there is in uh, Flint, Michigan. So that's a burden of 5% uh, already. For 25% of Flint residents who are making uh, less than 15,000 a year, the bill burden grows to 9%, a similar calculation to what Chris provided in his suggestion. And neither calculation factors in the elements that uh, Stephanie was talking about on the other essential uh, elements of the cost of living. Transportation, housing, and utilities are what I'm going to provide examples of in a minute. She also included, you know, eating and health and other essentials. So we came up with six ways to get to a better uh, bill through a three-month engagement process. The first was to improve customer service and ratepayer assistance programs so that there's goals for increasing affordability, not only across classes or parts of a community, but for individual households. In a lower income community, people expect to get counseling, and they don't get the quality of information that we've been uh, uh, exhibiting here. Uh, we want to redefine assistance to include both uh, uh, bill relief and subsidy and further benefits from investment and efficiency so that the bills start to go down. And, um, and this is doable. This one's doable at almost zero cost. Uh, you'd be amazed at how much gets spent in each of your communities on counseling right now. So your water bill tomorrow would, I'm sorry about the sizing of this. Your water bill tomorrow would actually tell you all these things. It would tell you this online with your own website. We got Flint to modify their replacement water line project to include the cost of an advanced metering system and the software that will be developed this year so everybody gets their own customized advice and page. And it's similar to uh, other kinds of bills we identify here from the energy industry. The second was to develop and use residential and um, energy and water efficiency programs together. You don't have to invent energy efficiency in Ohio. You need better support for it than you've got right now, but all of your investor-owned and publicly-owned utilities do provide uh, energy efficiency programs. Cincinnati, for example, has an excellent one-stop shop for audits, contractors, and affordable financing. Uh, you have the weatherization assistance and LIHEAP program. The goal is to take the financial pressures off of the households, not just to lower the financial pressures due to the way that the water bill needs to get um, 
uh, reinvented. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it made a lot of sense to the investor-owned utility that's serving Flint, and they will be announcing a massive commitment to marrying these two programs together for energy efficiency and for uh, uh, water cost reduction uh, together uh, by next month. And uh, that's something, again, that could be done ev everywhere. Three, engage major Flint institutions as partners in water systems improvements. So Flint um, is basically centered around a half dozen activities, two hospitals, two uh, colleges, uh, the downtown uh, area, uh, one major bank, and the General Motors uh, plant. They have an obvious stake in getting this right. Um, they can, you can do it together, you can have it done to you. I mean, somebody made the point earlier this morning about the impact on, uh, on businesses. GM made the brave choice to only temporarily get a new water source when the lead crisis happened. It was sort of a challenge back to the city. You hit these standards, we'll become a revenue customer again, and they stayed. Um, I think it's possible to build a broader uh, partnership. The fourth is to invest in uh, energy efficiency retrofits to Flint's and its suppliers um, systems because energy is a really big cost. Every one of your cities, the cost of providing energy for water and sewer pumping is one of your three largest uh, cost centers. But the 12 reports that had been done in the wake of the Flint water crisis by very reputable firms, some of which were named on unnamed slides just shown by some people. Not a word about energy costs in any of them. So there's an opportunity for some shared savings there. Lower the cost of the system and share some of that in, uh, in some rate relief is an obvious sort of thing. And that starts to help you lower that red line to something more reasonable too. The fifth can be done anywhere. Rain and increasing rainfall is a fact of life. We found in Flint, that 31 inches of rain and five inches of rain equivalent from snowfall was a whole lot more water falling on Flint than was being um, pumped and treated in total. And yet the biggest use of water during the warm months are, are for what? For irrigation, for, for watering, public rights of way and lawns and parks and so forth. And uh, I just want to say that we need to treat um, green infrastructure, surface permeability, and direct capture of rainwater a lot more seriously, because not everything has to be treated to exactly the same standard, but we're doing that. You talked about uniform rates. I suggest that we could live with a little bit less than a uniform standard for what we water lines and parks with. And the sixth was to come up with a streamlined approach to uh, water and community affordability systems. Uh, markets work like this. They're random access, unless you put something in the middle that makes it easier in a one-stop shop to get the information and the services and the financing that you need. Uh, I'm privileged to be president of the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. The best programs in the country are all organized like this. They are organized by either departments that have been set up like this or special new uh, districts set up like this or nonprofit corporations. You've got to get the coordination at the point of delivery, not just at the point of departmental desiloing if you're actually going to do it and we're not there yet. All right, so what does this mean for Ohio? So if you look at, this is for a 10-year period ending in 2014. It's only gotten worse um, since then. Um, so if you look at that first income quintile, the average income um, was about $9,000 a year. And compared to the cost of living by 2014, uh, those households fell behind an average of almost $900 a month. And that's why we have means tested. Uh, programs. Nobody's suggesting that people should suck in their guts and make up uh, that one, except when we misapply these affordability standards, you could uh, inadvertently end up with something like that. Uh, there's a range around that, uh, around that $900 a month and around that income level for the first income quintile, too. The, below that, the second income quintile, we had income averaging around 23000 a month, and those households were still in 2014 falling behind on the cost of living by $407 uh, a month. If you take those numbers up to 2018, it's a $1,000 a month deficit for the first quintile on average. 
and it's around $600 a month for the second income quintile. Right there is most of the justification you need to make sure we have a two-tiered system of who gets targeted uh, in any affordability assessment and more importantly in any assistance that gets uh, uh, targeted as well. Um, turning now to a principal recommendation I have, we don't have to invent better affordability indexes. We do need to learn how to apply them uh, to, the, to, to the reason why we're here today, the cost of water, sewer, and related services. And I want to suggest that we could do worse um, than not only adopting the excellent thinking that um, Stephanie and the United Way have uh, brought to the fore with Alice, but piggybacking on some of the existing tools that are out there. So if you ask the question, why is there a 30% standard to define affordability on the cost of uh, housing? And I spent a lot of years tracking this one down. I was sure because I was trained as both an engineer and a political scientist, it was a committee in Washington that had come up with it and stood behind it. There never was such a committee. What I found was a remnant of an old English poem that the home economics movement taught to students, the last line of which was, a week's wage for a month's rent. Well, you do the calculation, that gives you your quarter of income standard for housing. And now all of you know all of the hard science behind <laughs> housing affordability uh, indexing. And it turns out not to be a bad um, rule of thumb. Um, sometimes it's used to def define a typical expenditure, sometimes to analyze trends, sometimes to administer or even screen eligibility for appropriation of available um, supports, to make selections of a household for a rental unit or to qualify a mortgage, and increasingly to educate and market, to share information, whether through direct marketing of programs or through counseling. And just one more word about counseling. One half of adult Americans now regularly seek financial counseling. One half. They seek it through eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball contact with people, not over the internet, because they trust transactions that are personal. And half of the recipients are the, are the people we've been talking about in the first two income quintiles, and the other half are mostly in the upper income quintile. They're doing it voluntarily and it's often mandated at the bottom. So a couple of quick tools that exist already. Um, this is from the Housing Plus Transportation Affordability Index that we created 10 years ago. It goes down to the census block group level and up as high as, uh, as your metropolitan area and everything in between. You can get all the data you ever wanted on the cost of housing, transportation, the sum of housing and transportation, and uh, uh, an index, how that uh, equates out as a percentage of the dreaded median income. Um, also as a percentage of 80% of median income. And uh, this has been used across the country at all scales uh, to raise money. And the reason it works is because even as you go from left to right here, you're, um, let's see, let me get this right. Okay, so in the upper left-hand corner, you're looking at a straight median income calculation. Everything that's affordable in metropolitan Columbus, including where we are right now, is color-coded yellow, all right? As you go from median income to 80% to the right, it shrinks on the bottom row uh, you're looking at um, further shrinkage as we go from 80% and apply it to different types of households. And what looked like a great big sea of yellow, affordable Columbus, all of a sudden, we've dropped the number of households living in affordable places by 180,000 just by going from median to 80% of median uh, income. So even though of the big metro areas, uh, Columbus has the highest median income. It also has the largest number of people living in poverty. Uh, it's 177,000 as of, as of last year. And the use of this, we don't have time to go into. Let me just say in 10 years, I'm really proud that it's getting applied 
by just about every metropolitan planning organization, including the ones um, in Ohio, many cities, large and small. We have thousands of users, and it's not just for studies and plans, it's moved billions of dollars into things that uh, improve affordability uh, across the country. And so that gives us a standard, I think, to shoot for. If you do the same review of EPA water and sewer affordability guidelines that we've been talking about all day, there's a similar set of, uh, of reasons for applying them and uses of them. Um, and, but we don't have the desired index yet. I think the last two speakers made the case eloquently. We don't get down to small areas. We don't look at the full cost of living in these. They're one size fits all in their application. And I should add, they need to be easily updatable from year to year because they're mostly based on census or other national uh, surveys. And we need to be able to take that into account. Now, I'm going to read this to you because it's not going to work otherwise. This is my example of why I think the last two speakers were correct. So we did a version of this index for HUD called the Location Affordability Index. You can get the data on download in each of your communities. Um, it was invented so that the HUD consolidated plans could better, uh, more meaningfully and reliably uh, fill out their housing gap analyses every five years with annual updates and uh, do them on a reliable basis. And uh, in fact, the regulation that was issued uh, for this called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, according to the Supreme Court, is legal. The Trump administration has chosen to act otherwise. So you can't get this nifty map tool right now because they took it down. They said it was too expensive to spend $100,000 a year to make it easy for the public to use. But we wrote it, and I have it, and we will find a way to get it out. So assuming that that's true, this data I'm going to show you really quickly in four slides is available for every one of your communities. So if you take the MHI standard um, and you look at what the residual income is for households after a median income household uh, in Columbus um, spends uh, their money on housing and transportation, they've got $31,000 a year uh, left over. The average bill for water and sewer in Columbus is, uh, is 1,272, so that's 4.1 percent of residual income. So you pass the test sort of if you're um, if you use the 4.5% guideline of being able to stay in, under it only if you're the median income household. If you go down to 80% of income, you're up to 4.8%. So you're over the guideline um, already. With this tool, we can go to lower incomes. This is 50% of AMI, and now I'm showing another feature. This is for a single parent, two kid household, of which we have way too many. Um, that's just the nature of the landscape that's out there. Um, you know, it's very different than having a two-parent, single kid household. And uh, so they're earning 50% of AMI. The uh, residual after paying for housing and transportation is now plummeted to $9,200 a year. We've lowered the bill accordingly because it's a smaller household, but they're at 10.6% of the residual. I mean, right here we're close to the top end of the bottom two income quintiles, and we're at 10.6% of the residual. So I think that validates independently what Rich and Stephanie and Chris uh, just showed us and the questions that Napa raised in its report, which Brenner is going to tell us about in just a minute. If you go to very low-income individuals, finally, we're at 20% of AMI. Um, they're, they're in negative territory on residual income here. The average uh, water bill for uh, that, that household of $890 a year is 109% of their available uh, income. So that also validates the consumer expenditure data that I showed. Um, we have used this kind of data to come up with poverty reduction plans in places as different as Memphis and Albuquerque. We have um, mapped out where the poor live in Columbus. Uh, and we have a forthcoming tool that allows you to assemble a poverty reduction plan based on what combination of raising income and lowering the cost of living would actually take people 
to a place that's 20% above the appropriate poverty line uh, for their household. So if you could produce $500 million a year worth of cost of living reduction in income increases, which by the way is less than one third of 1% of the gross metro product in this region, you could drop the poverty rate in Columbus from 21 to 12%. That's what they call a big, hairy, audacious goal. I used it in Columbus because Columbus has actually stepped up to the plate on a number of the things that you would have to do. So when you say green infrastructure, the work that it takes to produce these lovely green infrastructure landscapes, and we have handbooks on how to do this, as well as the net economic benefits end up producing that level of savings, whether you do it on green infrastructure or that plus better transit or energy efficiency. And where's the money come from? A lot of it's already here. The part that isn't here could be a result of a series of negotiations such as we had in Flint with the utility bringing money to the table that otherwise wouldn't come there even though it's appropriated. And uh, as Rich and others have pointed out, there's other things that we could be demanding in terms of use of the resources we've already got, the revolving funds, as well as uh, new uh, resources that are forthcoming. So I invite you all to go to cnt.org slash water. You can see these sorts of tools. They're available. The stuff I'm showing you is open source. I'm not saying it's all ready for prime time, but I think we could look forward to perhaps applying some tools that are all, almost 90% of what they need to be in order to build the backbone of the system that I think we're being asked to get behind. And that's the show for today. So thank you very much. I'm Todd Danielson uh, with Avon Lake Regional Water. Thank you very much for your attendance today, and thank you uh, to the con conference organizers. I can't believe the number of state and federal EPA people that are here, so it really shows the importance for this. Um, also, um, thanks for everybody's posterity. I know these chairs are a little hard. Um, I'll try to be quick, and I will try not to be as uh, I, I can put my wife to sleep at night. She asks me about the day at, at work, and she goes right to sleep. So I'll try not to do that with you. Um, so let's get moving. Um, I'm from Avon Lake, Ohio, and uh, this is a picture of, of what we look at to our north. I'm right in between Lakewood and Elyria, so we, we've got a lot of, of residents uh, or people from, from this part of the state talking today. And you know, we're talking about Avon Lake, uh, we're talking about Lake Erie. And essentially, uh, one of the things, unfortunately, with Lake Erie is we've either taken it for granted or we've taken advantage of it over many years. And we are one of the combined sewer communities uh, that we've talked about quite a bit today, um, 70 plus in Ohio, 700 to 800 plus in, in the state, uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the country. Um, now we, um, I thank our Board of Municipal Utilities, back in 2004, we entered into a long-term control plan with, uh, with Ohio EPA. And that long-term control plan said that we would separate all of our sewers by the end of this year. By the end of this year. So we've got three months that we'll be done separating our sewers. And actually we will be, um, but we will not have finished uh, preventing these. Because in 2009, about five years into our plan, we realized that sewer separations alone would not prevent overflows. So then we had to come up with some sort of other solution because not only were we overflowing into Lake Erie and we were impacting Lake Erie, we were overflowing into basements. Um, and I know all of you who have answered those phone calls don't like hearing or re being the recipient of, of the anger um, from the other end. Um, we like to say in Avon Lake, and I'm sure you probably would say the same thing, that basements are storing for, for storing your memories, not other people's wastes. So um, what we had to do was we had to come up with a solution. We had to figure out what was the right way to, um, to come up and, and, and have that answer that helped to protect Lake Erie, helped to protect people's basements, and helped to protect the pocketbooks. And we had to do it quickly. 
And that was one of the big things is because when I came to Avon Lake Regional Water, it was 2010, late 2010. And uh, at least those of us in Northeast Ohio remember that 2011 was the wettest year on record. So we had five different basement backup events in 2011. And as you can imagine with customers saying, hey, wait a minute, how many hundred year storms are you going to have? Uh, we had to come up quickly. And what we decided at that time was um, not only do we separate our sewers, but our customers needed to separate their laterals. Um, that was not necessarily a very popular um, decision. However, uh, you never let an emergency go to waste. So when we had the emergency of all of these basement backups, people actually were willing to separate their laterals. Um, but what we had to do this in a way that was affordable. How can you come up with a way that people can actually spend three to four, maybe even more thousand dollars to separate their laterals. So um, thank you to our board of municipal utilities for coming up with this idea where Avon Lake Regional Water, we're a water and wastewater provider, but not only are we going to be a water and wastewater provider, but we would be the bank of Avon Lake, essentially. Um, now, we don't have overly deep pockets, so how could we become the bank of Avon Lake? The best way is a partnership with Ohio EPA. And going back to what um, Dr. Sawyers had said earlier today, um, you know, Jerry Rao is a trailblazer. And I, I definitely would say that too, because I would not be standing here if we didn't have Jerry Rao to thank. Because what Jerry Rao did is he implemented with us what, uh, what they term conduit financing. And what that basically is, is we are now loaning money to our customers. We are, are loaning up to $4,000 to our customers so that they could separate their laterals. Um, we started this program, uh, the loan program, in 2016. And since 2016 to date, so just over three years, we have made over 350 loans to our customers. And those 350 loans are at about $1.5 million. So we borrowed money from Ohio EPA. And um, so essentially, they give the money to us. We then give it out to our customers. Our, our customers pay us back uh, through our loan, pr through, through our quarterly billing, and then we pay it back to Ohio EPA. Uh, it works very well. Ohio EPA cannot do microloans. That's just not the way they're set up. Uh, but we have the billing mechanism already in place, so we can do that. Um, and it's worked very well. So you know, I'm standing here, um, and as I was thinking about what I was going to say, uh, I think a lot of you in the room you know, look like you're from the era that you would actually remember Monty Python. And you know, Monty Python is and now for something completely different. So we're talking about affordability in a much different way here. I'm not talking about changing the rates. I'm not talking about these other things. I'm talking about a way to put money into the hands of our customers in another way, a way that they are able to do something that they must do. They needed to separate their laterals. And you know, they might have been every couple of years having to, to use the, the root cutter and cut the, you know, cut the roots in the laterals or something else. Uh, this is a way that they have been able to make an investment in their own property uh, to potentially save their own basement backups uh, for root issues or whatever else. Um, so quickly, um, essentially the highlights of this program. Our Board of Municipal Utilities wanted to come up with a new way to, to help our customers you know, make something more affordable. Um, so they implemented this loan program. Ohio EPA, DEFA, uh, was able to think of a new and unique way to, uh, to take their loan program, the state revolving loan program, and help us create our own revolving loan program. So that worked really well, so it was a unique way. Now, I think one of the themes that all of us um, who have been speaking today have talked about is the amount of, of work that our staff have, to ha have had to do for any of the variety of programs. I know Columbus was talking about all of the interactions that they were having, and all these other you know, um, you, you know, municipalities have, have talked about that. It's the same thing for what we are doing. You know, we, uh, I know we have a unique situ situation where we are doing 100% separation of our sewers, and now we're requiring our customers to separate their laterals. Um, we had to, to go out and in inspect all of the properties, we had to interact with the homeowners, interact with the contractors, and then administer a program. So it is a lot of work. There's, there's no doubt about that it's a lot of work. But essentially, uh, by, by all of our customers that had to separate their laterals doing this, it's hugely reduced the amount of water that we've had coming into our sanitary sewer. And therefore, as we continue and, and we complete our separations this year, 
And then we work with Ohio EPA to finish, uh, finish off to help prevent sewer overflows. This is one way that we have been able to reduce the amount of water in that system and therefore either flowing into Lake Erie or flowing into people's basements. Um, so, you know, in essence, the customers now have, you know, have made a significant reinvestment in their property in a much more affordable way. And, and um, not only do I want to thank Jerry Rao, but I, I, uh, Craig Butler, I don't know if he's still in the audience or not, but one of the reasons why um, the, the previous director of Ohio EPA had said uh, that he really wanted to help make this happen, um, and I know Deepa was talking a lot about this, is, is the, the broad scale uh, ways that this could be implemented. Uh, for instance, now that we have this revolving loan program set up, we intend to use it in other ways, maybe to help our customers reinvest in their laterals if they have a, a leaky lateral, or maybe let's take it from the wastewater side over to the water side, uh, lead service lines, huge way that we could potentially help our customers you know, invest on in the private side of lead service lines. Um, you know, maybe we do stormwater um, types of improvements where they could put in a yard drain so that they get more water off of their property and instead of having the water on their property uh, and therefore it would, it would not potentially get into their leaky lateral. So there are a lot of ways to implement this. Uh, we are very um, happy that Ohio EPA helped us do this. Um, we look forward to continuing to find other ways to to do this, and um, that is my time, and I'm glad that I was able to speak quickly and keep you all awake. Uh, with that, I'll turn the, turn the floor over. Thank you. I'm Brenna Isman. I'm the Director of Academy Studies at the National Academy of Public Administration. Um, I think you heard the reference to Napa before. Unfortunately, we are neither the, uh, well, we're not the spark plugs or unfortunately the wine. Um, which I think right now, I think there's a bunch of people that would enjoy a little bit. It's been a, a long day, but it's been uh, a really great one, and I am so appreciative to be able to be here today. Um, I forgot. There we go. Um, Chris mentioned a little bit about a report uh, that we put out uh, several years ago. Just real quickly, uh, we are a congressionally chartered nonprofit. Um, we are sort of like the little sister, uh, the much smaller sibling of the National Academies of Science, but obviously looking at, at public administration. Um, and I think what we bring to the table that's a little bit unique is uh, that we are a nonpartisan, objective, neutral arbiter. Um, we write our reports, the majority of them. Um, we write under the uh, guidance of a panel of our fellows. We have over 900 fellows. We actually had a few that were mentioned today. Greg Lashutka, um, former Columbus mayor, and uh, Senator Voinovich are, are, are uh, two of our fellows. Um, and they represent all sorts of leadership, uh, thought leadership in, in public administration. Uh, so we had a panel of five members that uh, led the work that we did for this study. Um, this study was a Senate Appropriations Committee in a report in 2016 that directed uh, EPA to contra contract with NAPA um, for an, uh, to conduct an independent study to create a definition and uh, framework for community affordability. Um, the ask of this report evolved a little bit over time, um, and it was, as I said, delivered in October of 2017. And the, the uh, findings and recommendations focused uh, not only on uh, the affordability framework um, that then um, Chris and his colleagues expanded on, as well as looking at uh, some innovative solutions for community affordability to kind of expand the, the series of options, looking at integrated planning as another mechanism. Um, uh, and then also looking at the benefits and cost and the performance standards so that it really was looking not only at, at the entire picture, but then how are you going to remain accountable and how is everyone going to have a role in this. Um, just a few quick uh, highlights. Um, at the end of it, we had 21 recommendations. I promise we, I will not go through all of them. I'm just going to focus on a few that really resonated and connected with the conversations we're having today. Um, and it's a, it's a really rewarding opportunity for, for us to see the evolution of, and the response to the recommendations where there's been opportunities to incorporate it into activities uh, that e APA headquarters is looking at as well as, as the stakeholders and the folks um, on the ground in the communities. Um, there were sort of four main topics that kind of uh, organized a lot of, of the recommendations. Obviously the tension between uh, competing imperatives. 
a really fragmented governance of the water industry, as we've talked about uh, numerous times today, you know, the clean water, uh, safe drinking water, regulatory approaches, um, varied viewpoints, and a lack of common understanding of both the why, uh, more about the why, and now we're looking more at the how. How do we do this? And this is an example of, of thinking through, hearing some of the good practice today on the how for integrated planning in particular. Um, and then the EPA support is a critical element for implementation and extension of, of these innovative approaches, and again, demonstrated today by, by EPA's presence. Um, so as I said, uh, the, the, four, the first uh, four or five recommendations um, dealt with the, uh, uh, the affordability framework specifically, and looking at, as we keep talking about today, the imperfections around 2% uh, median household income. Um, the, the report uh, that followed this did a really good job of evolving what that should look like and putting some more meat on the bones and giving a more thoughtful analysis of what it would look like. Um, we're very appreciative that the criteria that our panel laid out in terms of what this should look like were uh, incorporated into the report and the discussion and then evolved from there. Um, I will say that uh, one of the things that, that jumped out at, at me, too, was um, just the, the issue of not only the, the framework, but also hearing from um, Stephanie and from uh, Scott in terms of new and different ways to continue to, co to discuss the, the affordability and what does that look like and how are we framing it and defining it. Um, one thing I would like to add to, and I, I think it kind of came up, but I just wanted to once again sort of drive it home is, uh, and I noticed when, when uh, looking at the, uh, the household burden income, is that it specifically mentions the combined uh, water service cost. Again, looking not only at that storm water, but looking at uh, uh, drinking water as well um, and sewer services. And I think that's an important piece of what that 2% looks like and what it should reflect, uh, not just merely uh, storm water. So I think what we were talking about was just the um, importance of the um, how now. And the, this has been such a great example of that. It's been really encouraging as we look to see the, the progress on the ombudsman. Um, I think that was another really important um, recommendation that we had in recognizing the importance of that liaison relationship. And I think it just um, also strengthens the importance of sort of the dual accountability, that both what the, the information that EPA at headquarters is sharing out in the regions as well as what, what the process is going to be in the communities and how they're going to measure success and how they're going to hold themselves to standards so that it keeps that dialogue open and that when, you know, all this conversation about being at the table together, there's a very clear sense of, of what the next steps are and, and how you're going to stay on track. Um, we had a, a series of other recommendations that I really, I think even if it were earlier in the day, I would tend to um, probably skip over just because it's, it's a little bit less uh, relevant to this group today, other than to say that um, our panel felt it was important to offer some uh, suggestions and some input on the whole um, benefit cost uh, um, analysis, and that that's a really tricky thing to do. We have a lot, am I on the right side? Um, I think I went too far. Um, it, it, there's a lot of discussion about the cost of all this, and I think everyone in this room recognizes the benefits of improved water quality, but when you're trying to, again, hold, hold yourself to an accountability standard and when you're looking at the performance standards, that's tricky. Um, and I think there was a real sense that the panel wanted to acknowledge that that is a challenge and that that is something that's important, but recognizing that it, it's, a tough, it's a tough battle. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. <laughs> I keep trying to figure out why I'm not on the right slide because it's all been uh, incorporated in and it says that I'm on slide 259. So I knew I didn't pr print that many, but that's what happens right here at the end of the day. So I can count just for you who, who may be wondering why she's struggling so much. Um, the last thing I just wanted to talk about was that we did recognize and acknowledge a series of, of innovative techniques that have been used. Um, we, did a, uh, we did visit several sites, uh, some of the integrated planning technical assistance 
um, recipients. And that was very eye-opening for us to be able to see on the ground. Again, it was a lot like these conversations today to hear what these communities are doing. Um, and not only did we hear about their, where they were on their integration, integrated planning journey, we also heard about the, some of the things that they're doing, be it in um, innovative uh, uh, stormwater management solutions, um, innovative uh, um, techniques to uh, address things such as, as the, uh, the financial aspects of it. And we, we did reference and, and uh, the panel um, felt strongly about acknowledging the role that um, WIFIA and SRF can play. It also cautioned against um, thinking that that's a silver bullet. It's, it's, it's one more thing in the toolkit, but recognizing that there's a lot of uh, new and different ways to, to utilize the resources available. So it was great to, to go after um, the Avon Lake presentation and hear just another example of, of one way to do that. Um, I think in closing our report, um, there was a few kind of closing thoughts that our panel again felt strongly um, about reiterating. It recognizes the efforts that EPA has undertaken to develop and improve necessary affordability guidance. It recognizes that the agencies work to address new and innovative approaches to achieving water quality standards reflect forward-looking efforts. Um, there is also a really an important piece of uh, what the panel wanted to get across in this report in terms of the innovative and deep commitment to meeting citizens, uh, citizens' needs and addressing water quality standards that's happening at the state and local level. Um, and just recognize this, this whole continuum um, and the importance of what we saw today and again what we saw in our site visits. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention, um, we've had a lot of conversations today about the importance of keeping the dialogue going and looking forward and thinking about what's next. Um, I kind of begged our leadership to agree to let me use some of these slides because uh, next month when we have our annual, our fall meeting, we're um, releasing um, our, this initiative in Grand Challenges in Public Administration. Uh, and over the course of uh, um, the last several months and a steering committee of about 14 fellows, uh, they identified a number of um, Grand Challenges Administration, kind of bucketing them into four um, categories. And the, some of the criteria had to be it was large in scope, seeking significant innovation, requiring a paradigm shift, and having a significant social and societal impact. Um, we are just sharing these with our internal organization today, actually. So um, it is, as I said, it's, it's brand new to us and, our, and it's, it's going to be released more formally at our meeting next month. Um, but there was a number of places where these grand challenges touched on what we're talking about here today. And just really quick in, in conclusion, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, many of you will, will go to our website, napawash.org. Uh, it has the, the EPA report, um, uh, as well as there'll be more information about these grand challenges, because one of the things we've recognized right away is the need to be able to convene these discussions to, to be able to inspire action, um, enhance the understanding of these issues, connect stakeholders, which is where um, so many of you in, in this room could be really helpful to inform us of what we understand. We sit primarily at the federal level, but we work with state and local organizations as well, and that really, we, we can't look at it in the vacuum of just looking at the federal space. Um, and then driving action plans. So I think what this will result in is, is some additional research on topics, some more convenings, connecting folks that might be already doing this. We, we certainly won't do all the work ourselves, and nor could we, but making those better connections um, in some of these areas. So just real quickly, the ones that kind of stood out to me as being areas, develop new approaches to public governance and engagement. That's, that's what we're doing today. Um, and hearing more about what works and what's been the most valuable to you in moving the ball forward is, is really uh, critical. Foster social equity. Clearly, the conversations about affordability um, and really uh, addressing that is, is squarely uh, in this discussion. And then in area three is pretty much entirely uh, 
looking at protecting the environment and preparing, uh, preserving natural resources, both looking at it from stewardship of national res natural resources for future generations, um, as well as creating safe and sustainable regional water systems. Uh, so in the, in the future months, as we roll out more of these initiatives, um, we'll be really interested in, in, in connecting with folks, especially in a state like Ohio that has taken such a, a proactive and innovative approach to this and really um, is moving in, in the direction that we need to go. Um, so I thank you for sticking around. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was the real end of the day, so I appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much for including me today.